Are you enjoying this conference? Yes? This is an incredibly gifted, incredibly diverse group of speakers. And this is what we try to do at EarthKeeper, is to combine the science with the sacred. And the people that bring the science in are absolutely as important to the integral circle as the sacred. One of the things that we say is that science omits the sacred and the sacred omits the scientific. And so that is our goal to bring these two together. And there is a complete circle that will occur when these two come together. So. And so it's a great honor to introduce one of my heroes, David Hatcher Childress. I was a speaker at the ARE two years ago and David was also a speaker. So was Greg Braden. And Dr. Greg Braden got up and said something that I can totally relate to. And he said that it was the work of David Hatcher Childress that brought him into the investigations of alternative histories. And it was, for me, also a great truth that it is the books of David Hatcher Childress, the body of work provided by David Hatcher Childress that opened a new generation that gave others the ability to follow the trail that he had blazed. And so this is the real Indiana Jones. These books, yes, a round of applause, please. David Hatcher Childress. David has visited countless countries, examined numerous hundreds of places that are mysterious because they don't fit into the uh, understanding that mainstream academics have of where we began. And so his work has inspired so many. 
and his life has been spent in providing light where there is shadow, clarity where there is confusion. David is also the voice of the History Channel's Ancient Alien series. And he will speak tonight, as you can see, ancient aliens, ancient technology, and megalithic buildings. And so, an Earthkeeper round of applause to honor David Hatcher Childress. Okay, great. All right, I'll put this here, and thanks, Tib. So, well, it's great to be here, and uh, I was at uh, Tib's conference in Little Rock a couple of years ago, and that was, that was good. So, I don't recognize some of you from that. That's great. Tell you a little bit about myself. I'm uh, I'm born in France. However, uh, my parents are Americans. In fact, my father is from Colorado, and I grew up in Colorado too. Uh, as a little kid, I lived in Denver and in, in Lakewood over here to the north of the airport. And my father was from Durango, actually. So I I really grew up in, in Southwest Colorado in Durango. Later, my parents got divorced, and I my mother, my brother, and I moved up to Missoula, Montana. And uh, in fact, and Graham Hancock in his presentation talked about Lake Missoula, if you recall. Um, I do want to say what we're going to see here today uh, from me, and then I'll have another presentation tomorrow. There will be uh, a lot of similarity between, and, and some of the slides I show, uh, between Graham Hancock's and, and Robert Chalk's too. But I think there'll be enough difference and uh, unusual things that, you know, it's, it's that you'll enjoy it and you, you won't mind that. My presentation is going to be pretty fast and furious and uh, it would be good if we dim all the lights. I have a pretty loud voice too and sometimes I get excited. <laughs> I do want to say a little bit about Ancient Aliens. Uh, yes, I show. Um, I don't write that show. And, you know, it's fun to be on it. Uh, I enjoy it. Uh, Giorgio, by the way, is a very good friend of mine. And he's a great guy. <laughs> and you've got to ask, what, what's with that guy's hair? You know? <laughs> Whenever somebody, you know, stops me at an airport or something, and they're like, you're that guy in Ancient Aliens, aren't you? And I'm like, yeah. What's with that guy's hair? <laughs> He's a great guy. So, and uh, in fact, this, uh, this summer, uh, I'm going to Australia with Eric Von Doniken, and we're doing uh, some conferences in all over Australia for Nexus Magazine. And that will be fun. I am on the show, Ancient Aliens. Uh, tomorrow, I will, what we're about to see right now is a lot of megalith building. We're gonna go to South America and around the world. And then we're going to see some cone heads and unusual skeletons. Uh, this might be the ancient alien part. I, you know, I, I don't ascribe everything to ancient aliens at all. I'm, I'm really more of an ancient civilizations person and Atlantis and that civilization goes back uh, many tens of thousands of years. Uh, but there's the ancient alien part too. And, um, and tomorrow in the presentation, uh, we'll do uh, giant stone balls around the world, obelisks, uh, Nikola Tesla stuff, and then we'll go to the moon and Mars. And that's all, that's all tomorrow. Today we'll stay pretty much earthbound. So let's go ahead and try and dim the lights and let's go. So uh, these are the ruins at Malta. And uh, until uh, the discovery of Gobekli Tepe, mainstream archaeologists basically said that the oldest megalithic ruins in the world were on Malta, and that they were from around 7,000 BC. And now, uh, now they're saying that Gobekli Tepe is is from like 9,600 BC. On Malta, by the way, is this cave, the Gardalam Cave. 
Uh, this is evidence that Malta and the whole Mediterranean was hit by a giant tidal wave in sometime in prehistory. It washed all these woolly, uh, little pygmy woolly mammoths and, and hippos and things like that into this cave, and then they recovered the bones. So the, the idea that at that time the Mediterranean perhaps was filled in, mainstream archaeologists tell us that there's over 200 known sunken cities in the Mediterranean, and uh, they weren't built underwater. <laughs> Here's Gobekli Tepe. Uh, we already saw some of that from both uh, uh, Shock and Graham Hancock and the T-shaped megaliths. Graham also pointed out, uh, you know, these animals that are on the T-shaped megaliths at, and things at, at Gobekli Tepe. Uh, I was there uh, with my wife uh, about five years ago or so. And some models of it, as Graham pointed out, uh, what's important about Gobekli Tepe II was that it, it was built as this megalithic um, site, and then it was buried. It was purposely buried, and then, and so the uncovering of it does, is, gives them good dating, and uh, so they use the carbon dating. Uh, my, my personal interests have always been huge megaliths, uh, the bigger the better, and how the, they would be moved. And um, I also am known for writing books on anti-gravity, Tesla, things like that. This is Baalbek, and um, Graham was talking about that earlier. That was great that he was able to go there. The largest known cut stone block in the world, uh, they are the ones at Baalbek, and they weigh uh, over 1,000 uh, tons. And so the idea is partly with, with me and my books is is you know why are people trying to build with such gigantic stones? And again, with, from our perspective, and and certainly from mainstream archaeology perspective, you know this is just people are taking on some kind of monumental task that just seems so incredible. I mean, why would they even w try to build like this? And and with me, uh, and what I constantly am. In, trying to get out is that it had to be easy for them to do these things and, and not so incredibly difficult. Mainstream archaeology has to try to explain all this stuff. You know, how are you going to move a thousand ton block of stone? Uh, some years ago, a mainstream French archaeologist came up, this is his explanation, that to move these giant blocks of stone, they had to, to build a, a huge cage around the, this thousand ton block of stone. Uh, there's, there would be small little hourglass notches put into, this, into the top of the stone with all these pulleys in the cage. And then you would lift this giant stone a few inches above the ground and move it a few inches. And then you'd have to redo the whole thing. This, I mean, this is, this is the only way the mainstream can, can conceive of moving these stones. Uh, also, by the way, what the foundation of King Solomon's temple in Jerusalem, and today it's known as, as the Dome of the Rock with the, the mosque there and the, the Wailing Wall, there are giant blocks of stone like at Baalbek there as well, but they're hard to see because they're inside of a, a tunnel. Going to Abydos, Egypt, here's what we're looking at. This is the, Os the tomb of Osiris, the Osirion in Abydos. Abydos has also a, a dynastic temple there, but there's also this, what it seems to be a pre-Egyptian building, and that is the, the Osirion. And as we look at it, most of the Osirion was underwater uh, in a swamp, and the Egyptian government literally spent decades pumping the water out of the Osirion just so they could see what was there and what the giant blocks are. And so if you will look at some of these little knobs and and notches that are on the, uh, these blocks. And, and they're there at the Osirion, and we're gonna see these again in, in Peru. And that's where we are now. So we're, we're in Cusco. This is uh, one of the jigsaw walls in Cusco made with uh, granite. This is the famous 12-sided uh, stone in an alleyway in Cusco. And in fact, this appears on the label of the Cuscania beer. And in fact, in Cusco, uh, I've been told there's only one industry in that entire city, and it's the beer brewery. 
So here we are. Graham was showing some of that, the, the polygonal jigsaw stone masonry that you have in Peru. And that kind of a masonry, too, is the, the blocks of stone are all locked together like a jigsaw puzzle, no mortar. And so when a shock wave of an earthquake hits, it, it's all locked together, and the stones can survive uh, massive uh, earthquake shocks. This is actually the Necromanticon, which is in northern Greece, northwest Greece, near to Albania. And it, this was only discovered by archaeologists in the 1960s, but it has the same kind of jigsaw pattern and stonework that you also find in, in Peru. This is the Sacsayhuaman uh, giant fortress or whatever it was. Uh, I, I think it was some kind of Vamana airport. There were towers here too. This is an aerial view of it. Uh, right in front of the jig, zigzag giant walls of, uh, of Sacsayhuaman is this huge, huge field, open area. And for me, and I'll get into this a little bit more later and, and more tomorrow, the whole idea of ancient flight, of airships, landing even these airships onto these, this, these giant fields. Uh, Machu Picchu has that too. And has a huge sort of like landing field, uh, kind of flat football field right in the center of Machu Picchu. Cusco is such a fantastic place. And uh, it, as Graham Hancock was saying, uh, it's also my opinion that the Incas did not build uh, Sacsayhuaman or Machu Picchu uh, or, or even Cusco. And in fact, the way I try to explain it to people, and uh, oftentimes, you know, they're like, well, well, what do you mean the Incas didn't build, the, you know, this city? You know, how could that be? Today, when you're in Cusco, and this is, these are still shots of Sacsayhuaman, today, when you go to Cusco, you'll see uh, people, or in many cases, uh, descendants of, say, Spanish, they're living in these megalithic buildings, too, in Cusco. But they didn't build them. I mean, these buildings are indestructible. And even Earth. The big earthquakes in Peru can't destroy these buildings, but the, the later Spanish ones are often destroyed. In Cusco and around there, uh, these unusual blocks that are all carved up and upside down staircases and things like that. It's like there was some cataclysm. I'm, what I'm going to be showing you too is the idea that these people are using power tools. They're, I mean, power tools like we have today drills, saws, grinders, even plasma cutters and things like that. And it would almost seem in certain places around Cusco and Sacsayhuaman that people with these power tools are just going out and, and playing with them and using them, uh, practicing even. And, and that's what mainstream archaeologists are saying here. They're saying, oh yeah, well the Inca stone cutters they would go to these giant boulders and carve upside down staircases and things like that just to, to practice, right? And so there may be something to that. Around Sacsayhuaman too and throughout Peru, there is evidence of a, of a vast tunnel system going underground. There are areas around Sacsayhuaman and, and other areas of Peru, and I've, I've been inside some of these tunnels, uh, not for any great length, but there are areas where uh, this solid granite is cut through and cut through with tunnels and things like that. It's whoever was building these things, they were going through what would seem like a lot of effort and doing some amazing stuff, cutting through solid rock and, and building with gigantic blocks of, of granite or in some cases basalt and sandstone and limestone. Again, the mainstream are saying, yeah, it's just, you know, you get just so many thousand or, and hundreds of people dragging a, on a block of stone, you can move it. And there's some mathematical, uh, you know, figure for that. And even the idea that they would have had to have hundreds of people all uh, in harnesses and, and a special thing. But there's a problem with that. And, and even the mainstream uh, archaeologists who, who will tackle this, and there's not many, and that is because at certain places, like at Ollante Tombo, where these megalithic structures are on small knife ridges and cliffs, and they can't figure out where the 500 or 800 guys would all stand. <laughs> so, I mean, so these are the, some of the problems that the mainstream, you know, is, is going through with. And it, part of my job as, as a critic of, of mainstream archaeology is to, to know what their explanations are. And, 
and if, if they have some flaws in what their explanations are, then then I you know I, then I, I go there. <laughs> Machu Picchu. Machu Picchu is uh, the most popular uh, tourist site in all of South America. It gets more and more popular all the time. With a lot of the troubles in Egypt now, many people who would really go to Egypt on a vacation now or are going to Peru. And, and it's great for the Peruvian economy. I've been going to Peru since the mid 80s. Uh, I've been there when it was a curfew. Uh, I w I've been attacked on the streets because the police were all on strike. And, uh, and the economy just totally, you know, gone down the tubes. But now, and I'm, I'm so glad of this, that Peru's economy and, and the government, everybody is getting it together. So it's a great place to go. I hope you will go there. Machu Picchu is a megalithic city. It's a secret city on top of a mountain. It's also built, you notice these knobs and things like that. You also see that this is granite, huge lichen patches on there. And this is, these knobs are similar to uh, what we were seeing at the Osirion uh, at Abydos. Places like this, this is also part of Machu Picchu. Very fine cutting and, and fitting of these blocks. Uh, Machu Picchu is an astonishing place. This is actually my favorite place in Peru, and it's called Ollantaytambo. And in fact, uh, it's on the Urubamba River going down to Machu Picchu. And as you go up these stairs right up here, if you're a tourist, you're going to hike up these big terraces here. And right above this cliff right here that we're talking about is the giant sun temple of Ollantaytambo, and, it, and it's sitting right on, the, on top of a cliff, on a knife edge place. And this is, again, where the problem is, where the, the 300 or 900 guys who are all dragging the blocks up, you know, how can they stand? And also turn corners and things like that on these, these uh, the ramps and things that are going up. As you're walking up to Ollantaytambo, you, you eventually start going up these stairs, and then you get into these uh, megalithic jigsaw walls, and uh, they're, they're out of granite. And again, you see these curious knobs. Archaeologists can't really explain these knobs. They don't know why. They assume it ha they have something to do with the building, but they can't really put their fingers on it. Uh, it one of the, the, the standard explanation would be that somehow what they're doing is, it, because the blocks are so perfectly fitted together. I mean, and, and you, you can't even get a, a razor blade or a piece of paper between them. They're so perfect. But to make that perfection, again, would be this very piddly, uh, you know, moving the block up and then putting like um, beams under it. And then all this little tedious hammering to, to make sure it fit just perfectly. But still, that, that's not really such a good explanation yet. Um, again, we don't know exactly. Uh, another interesting explanation here would be using uh, what's called a plasma cutter, which would be like a, a lightsaber on, in the Star Wars movies, uh, which would be an electrified gas with, with super power in it, and, and you could melt stone. There's a scene in uh, Revenge of the Sith where, where Liam Neeson and, and Ewan McGregor, are, as Jedi Knights, are trapped in this space station and they're in this room. And to get out, they shove their lightsabers into this vault door and start melting it. If, you, if you've seen that movie, that's a great scene. And so, it, in a sense, if you had something like this and it's cutting stone or even melting stone, as you pulled that plasma cutter, I mean, it's going to be a super hot, electrified gas that's, that's melting stone. As you pulled it out of the stone, it w could create, in theory, th these little knobs like this. It's a, just an idea. As you get up there to the very top of the Sun Temple, as they call it, at Ayante Tombo, this is what you start to see. Gigantic blocks of granite. And they're, they're, they're just kind of st stacked around. They're lying there. This is exactly how Ollante Tambo looks today. It's how it looked when the Spanish got there. It's how it looked in Inca times, just like this. This is the main thing that you see, and everyone stands in front of this wall. It's really the only wall that's intact there. And uh, these, these very thin pieces of, of granite here are also very unusual. And uh, so you have megalithic blocks and then these fine pieces of, of thin uh, granite uh, that also carved in there. Very strange. 
So you're looking at something like this along the side of Ayantitambo. Now, now here's what the mainstream archaeologists are saying. They're saying, yeah, they dragged this giant block of granite up here, and then they notched it and whatnot, and then they just filled it in with all this like crummy rubble, right? <laughs> That's how the Incas built stuff. They... So yeah, once again, I mean, this, this, this is some probably 300 ton block of granite. It's got these unusual squares on it. Uh, once again, it's been notched right here. That notch is, is clearly for some other giant block of granite to be fitted there. But that never really happened. And instead, the Incas just filled it in with this crummy rubble. So what we might say, you know, this, this crummy rubble, this is Inca construction. And the giant blocks are something else, Atlantean construction, alien construction, or uh, even Sumerian construction, but somebody is using power tools, even anti-gravity, they, the they have the ability to levitate giant blocks of stone. And all these other blocks of stone that are just sitting here and stacked up, I mean, they're, somebody brought them up there. And, and either it's from a building that was completely blasted out in some you know, ancient super war where a missile or something hit this building and just threw it around, or they got all these blocks up there and intended, the, the, the real builders, you know, they intended to stack all these blocks up and, and make something, but, but they just they weren't able to finish. And, and something happened. I mean, just all the construction just came instantly to a complete halt. Now, when you're also there at Oyante Tambo, you start to see, if you look at these blocks of stone carefully, you see this very fine articulation of the stone, just uh, these little grooves and things cut. I mean, they're, they want to, and, and we're going to fit these stones, giant stones, all together in a very you know, perfect way. Now, what you also see there is, is this, and this is what's known as a keystone cut this T-shaped cut here, and there's one on the other side. You can see it there. And these, take a note of this because we're gonna see more of these. Here's a close up. This is a, it's a cut in a granite block at Ollantaytambo. It's known as a keystone cut. So there's gonna be another one of these on a, another corresponding and then molten metal is, is poured into it. And it has to be lying flat. It has to be lying flat. Uh, so that metals can be poured into it. And so you'd have a double T-shaped metal clamp, uh, probably a bronze or something, that, that's now spanning the two giant blocks. And it, what's funny is you're, I mean, these are huge blocks anyway, and they weigh a lot. You wouldn't think they're really going anywhere. But yeah, they want to put these extra little clamps on there too. And so we, we call them keystone cuts, and then the metal pieces are, are called clamps or sometimes cramps. So here we go, we're looking at uh, another keystone cut here. But now, if you walk around sort of this back side of the Sun Temple, just we're right nearby, there's this, another giant stone, and again, the crummy Inca masonry here, and here's the, a keystone cut. But that's, you know, this is not something that is useful. It's, this can't be where this stone was meant to go. Uh, you cannot use a keystone cut here because it can't be on a vertical wall. It has to be on a flat wall because the, the molten metal is poured into it. So this is a block that's put, been put somewhere where it really shouldn't be. Now, what, uh, on the, across the river from Ayante Tambo, and we're, we're going up there, there's the Urubamba River, and in fact, the, the temple itself that we were just looking at is right up here on top of these cliffs. These are some fields. Here's the Urubamba River here. And in fact, the, the quarry, which is where we're going right now, is, is on this giant granite mountain, which is across the river from the, the megalithic site. So this is the quarry, and it's an unusual quarry too because it's actually a giant pile of granite scree coming off this, this cliff face. And it, it's several thousand feet. Most tourists never get up to this area. Uh, you, it's an all-day walk. Uh, I've been up there uh, about three times. Uh, twice I rode horses up there. And the horses can't even go all the way. As you get up to the quarry site, what they are doing there is they take giant 
granite boulders, and then they start slicing them with apparently a giant saw. And what you see here, these are actually, they're, they're starting to saw like a loaf of bread. Uh, they're going to saw off this granite piece right here. Now, supposedly, the Incas didn't know about writing, and they didn't know about the wheel. And yet, when you get up to the uh, the quarry up there, there's this Fred Flintstone, uh, you know, stone wheel there, and it too has been sliced. I mean, some giant saw has just cut this thing, uh, and it, it's very smooth. All right, we'll go to back to Cusco, and we're in the uh, the Cori Concha, the famous Sun Temple uh, that w was used by the Incas and was a is a uh, was for a while after the Spanish conquest, it was uh, a monastery, a nunnery. Then it was partially destroyed in an earthquake in 1950, and that exposed some of these walls. And what you see there is, is also a megalithic building, but you, you start to see, again, a, a lot of articulation and these holes in the walls. And it's like some kind of machine or something. It was placed in these walls, and that there are holes and conduits for electrical cables and things like that to go through it. And there's a lot of, of very fancy articulation. It's, it's very well made. We'll go now uh, higher up into the Andes to Lake Titicaca, and there's a number of uh, plateaus there. Uh, this is going up to a, a site called Kutimbo, and uh, Graham Hancock showed a couple of photos of Kutimbo there too. On the way up to Kutimbo, there's this oddball spot and where it looks like, uh, again, power tools and polishing tools have been used to, to like smooth off the rock and polish it. I, I couldn't figure out what that was, this was all about. And uh, you can see the, the sudden roughness here and this line, but then the stone's very smooth. So uh, again, it looks like somebody with some kind of special power tools and grinders and, and buffers and things like that was playing around in this rock. You get to Katimbo, it has these uh, megalithic towers. They're also um, with a polygonal uh, type of granite. And at, like at Gobekli Tepe, they have these, there are serpents and other animals, uh, uh, pumas and things like that are, are in relief on the, uh, in some of the blocks. And it's interesting, the, the serpents, because you see this also at, uh, um, it, in Cusco, and we'll, we'll see that again. These are some pumas and other animals, and, and again, at, as Graham Hancock pointed out, at, at Gobekli Tepe, you have this kind of thing too, these megaliths with, with just animals uh, featured on them. This is a block of, of stone, a wall that's, that's right near the Plaza de Armas, the main plaza in Cusco, and it too has just some of the stones will have these uh, wavy serpents carved into it. Now, if you go to the Yazidi temples in northern Iraq, and the, the Yazidis are this ancient Iraqi, Sumerian, uh, Armenian, whatever, religion, one of the oldest religions in the world. They've recently been uh, coming into the news. Most people have never even heard of Yazidis. But yeah, because of the, the, all the, the ISIS stuff in, in Syria and Iraq, and the kidnapping, uh, ISIS has, has taken over Yazidi villages and, and enslaved other people. But they have these temples, and their temples too have these serpents on the walls. And this is, there's, there's not many uh, Yazidi temples that you can see. Uh, the, the only ones really that are still active in very, very northern Iraq and in Kurdistan. All right, so uh, we're now moving along Lake Titicaca and uh, uh, and this is the famous door, the, the door in the wall, the Amar, Amaru Muru door, sometimes called the Devil's Door. You can kind of see it from the Pan American Highway that, that's going along, well, that's actually not the Pan American Highway, but the main highway going along the, the west side of Lake Titicaca. As you get up to this doorway, it's, uh, this main part is, is about six feet high, it's just about the, the size of, of a normal person. Uh, then you have these, um, little channels on the side, and it's, it's a, I mean, it's kind of bizarre. I mean, why, it's a false door. There's this giant door just carved into, like, this cliff, and uh, some people claim, yeah, it's some interdimensional doorway. People today now like to go there and meditate. Uh, people have claimed to have 
mystical experiences and stuff like that. False doors like this also appear in Egypt, and uh, this is one in, in Giza. Uh, many Egyptian temples also have false doors, just, just sort of a fake door carved into uh, a wall or something like that. All right, here's Lake Titicaca, uh, it's the highest navigable lake in the world. It's, it's over 12,000 feet. Um, there are steamships, uh, even allegedly the Bolivian Navy has a, has a submarine in there or something. Uh, Bolivia is a landlocked country, so their Navy just gets to play around in, in Lake Titicaca. <laughs> Lake Titicaca is also, there are underwater structures in Lake Titicaca, and there, it's also a very active UFO area. And people who spend a lot of time in Lake Titicaca, uh, you, you will, you're likely to see a UFO. I can't say I have, uh, but you know, if you stay up all night, it's usually in the middle of the night that UFOs allegedly come out of the water. And most of that too, the, the very eastern side of Lake Titicaca, half of Lake Titicaca is in Peru, the other half's in, in Bolivia. Uh, here's some uh, you know, underwater ruins and things like that. There's supposedly uh, near the island of the sun, there's supposedly this gold uh, obelisk underwater that they talk about. One of the strange things about Lake Titicaca is that it has seahorses in it. And, and that's very strange. Seahorses are normally uh, you know, oceanic little creature, creatures. They live in uh, uh, tropical waters like around Indonesia and the Pacific and stuff like that. So the idea that there are uh, seahorses in Lake Titicaca, this, this is difficult for um, uh, biologists to really explain. James Churchward, who wrote the uh, Lost Continent of Moo books, he, this is one of his maps. He traveled around. He was a pretty cool guy. He was a British colonel in India. His guru supposedly showed him a secret library and told him about this lost con in the Pacific. And then it was, this was about 1890, and said, "Yeah, this is your mission is to go out in the Pacific and you know find the, 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 all the evidence for Mu." And so Churchward felt that like Tiwanaku and and Lake Titicaca was the that South America had been depressed, had been down, and the whole Amazon was what they called the Amazon Sea, and that somehow around Lake Titicaca and, and Tiwanaku was, was like a Panama Canal of Atlantean times and stuff like that. And that, that would be one way to explain that why, you know, how seahorses are in Lake Titicaca. The Gate of the Sun, uh, the Gate of the Sun too is, is kind of an unusual thing. It's, it's part of some other building, and apparently it was moved into place where it is. You see machines and stuff here, and other, other buildings, other giant walls would be fitted into that. They're totally gone now. And the Gate of the Sun just kind of sits there by himself. There are giant statues at Tewanaku. They're wearing turbans. Uh, and that was supposedly an Atlantean thing. To, in my mind, and in, in my book, uh, Ancient Technology in Peru and Bolivia, what I'm maintaining is, is that Tewanaku really was a, a huge metallurgical site and that it was for washing ores. Uh, there was all this mining was going on there, tin mining, gold mining, copper, you name it, it's all there. And that, that the Tiwanaku itself was, it was an area too, there was, a, there was a pyramid with an artificial lake on top of it. They would have had to use what's called a ram pump to actually get water uphill into this, this lake that was in the pyramid. And then that water was then used, here I'll go back for a second, Th this is the lake and how would it be, the, what's it called, the Acapana Pyramid. This unusual little uh, tunnel thing down here at the bottom, and in fact at the time they were, they were telling you, you know, oh, don't take photos of this. This is this just still under excavation now, this last six, seven years in fact. But these little tunnels and things would have apparently been part of this vast complex of water sluices and when Tiwanaku was really uh, being enacted and uh, in use, water was flowing throughout the city and even pouring down from these pyramids and stuff like that. And, and I, in my mind, it was to be washing ores, prepping them uh, to go into the forges where they would super be heated and then li literally liquid uh, gold and other metals were coming down. This is, uh, this is the famous Khan Tiki statue. Uh, also made famous by Thor Heyerdahl, who then named some of his ships Kontiki. And what's important with him, too, is that he has a beard and a mustache. American Indians don't have, and in South America, too, they, they don't really have, they don't have facial hair. They don't have mustaches, they don't have beards, they, they don't ever shave. 
not not Native Americans. Um, but this guy has a beard and a mustache, and his are, his hands are in what's called a tiki position. Uh, one over one hand over his heart and his one hand on his stomach. This is if you go to Tahiti and New Zealand and Pacific Islands, this is the well-known tiki position. And in in Tahiti and Pacific Islands, you're going to buy easily little pendants of of tiki, and he always will have his his hands this way: one hand over the stomach, one hand over the heart. This is the Akabana pyramid that was uh, artificial, uh, and water was pumped up to this Andean Cross Lake at the top. So here we go. This is what uh, Bolivia is there that you see Lake Titicaca. And there's another lake here. Lake Titicaca apparently was seawater originally, and there would have been, uh, it was the salt water. But later, as the water from the Andes came down, fresh water, it filled in. And then the, there is a, a river that drains from Lake Titicaca called the uh, Desaguadero. And it then goes down to another lake in Bolivia called Lake Popo. And that lake is now salt water. And so it's like all the salt water that was in Lake Titicaca ultimately drained into this other lake. Here's a satellite photo of Lake Titicaca. They, lake Titicaca is usually um, talked about as, as two lakes. One is this, the big lake here, and then the smaller lake down to uh, the south. And uh, here we go. So now here's a map of this, the smaller lake. Now this area. It's this area in here that I'm told that there's a lot of UFO activity, and UFOs are seen coming in and out of the water here. And uh, Bolivians all believe, and although you know part of it's in Peru and then part of it's uh, in, in Bolivia, and that also they believe there's a sunken city here that's underwater in this area. So this is Lake Titicaca. Lake Titicaca is also famous for its reed boats. Um, Reed boats were used in Iraq and in ancient Egypt and Morocco, also on Easter Island. Reed boats are unsinkable. They, they'll, even pieces of them will keep floating. They have a very shallow draft. They can go over coral reefs and things like that. This is a guy, a Bolivian artist, Ramiro Gonzalez, and uh, he did a book that I thought was kind of cool. And he imagined also uh, Tiwanaku and the whole area around the southern area of Lake Titicaca as being this, this huge water canal area. Um, you would have gone through uh, Tiwanaku on boats and things like that. And he envisioned also uh, South America as, as a, what they call a pole shift scenario, where uh, South America was really like a very long, thin continent, kind of like New Zealand, or uh, sort of like Norway or something, with, with fjords and stuff like that. and and that. Uh, Tiwanaku was built there um, during this period, and even you know the, the the North South Pole and Antarctica were in different places. This is the whole idea of, of what they call pole shift, and that the the North the poles of and continents actually you know move around on the Earth, and that's a number of books have been written about that. It's mainstream art geologists don't go for that too because it's it's cataclysmic. All right, here's uh, this is Puma Punku, and uh, the giant. Uh, these are Pumapunk is built out of, of sandstone and granite. Again, now we're looking at these keystone cuts, just like we saw at Ollantaytambo. Now, mainstream archaeologists all admit that the Incas did not build Tiwanaku. Tiwanaku is thousands of years before uh, the Incas. The Incas are actually very uh, near to us in history. Uh, the, the Inca Empire had just formed about 200 years before the, the Spanish got there. So here are these giant keystone cuts, and these are huge. So each one of these, these huge slabs of, of these are sandstone, but yeah, this molten metals uh, of a double T-shape, or hourglass shape, are going to be poured into these things. And they're huge. You wouldn't think that they're going anywhere. And Puma Punku is pretty interesting. It's like some huge cataclysm and tidal wave, probably from Lake Titicaca, hit it and destroyed it. Uh, that's a piece of um, uh, granite right there. Here we go, the, this, the special articulation and uh, of carving of these granite blocks. I mean, somebody's doing this with power tools. And we'll, we'll, we'll see that again, more of these keystone cuts for the, for the clamps, more of them too. Huge, huge clamps. And in fact, where would the metal 
of the, the, the support and these clams come from? Well, from Tiwanaku itself, because it itself was a huge uh, mining metallurgical um, complex where, uh, where, they were, where the metals were coming from right there. Uh, here we are. This is shooting an Ancient Aliens show with the, the H blocks. The H blocks are like kind of granite Lego blocks that are like prefab made uh, by like a CAD computer design that's cutting these blocks out and then spewing them out and and then the builders would just take them and and fit them together and they would be locked in. Uh, again, more giant uh, keystone cuts, more, more keystone cuts around um, Puma Punku. This is my friend, um, uh, Christopher Dunn, who's a British engineer. He lives in Illinois and not far from where I live. And he runs a, a, a aircraft machine shop. He's just recently retired. But he uh, really showed me a lot of things that are of, of evidence of power tools. And he works himself with, with lays and power tools constantly. And yeah, so if we look at these, this here, you see these, these very thin saw marks. And there's drill marks there, too. So somebody with really a power saw is, is making very smooth, clean cuts in this granite. And then they're taking a, a drill, and they're drilling down and making small holes. And in fact, what probably what was going on there was then, get this, at places at Tiwanaku and, and also other areas of Cusco, the walls were, were basically wallpapered with sheets of gold. And uh, the, those holes were for um, uh, gold pins and, or bronze pins to go in there and hold the sheets of gold that were everywhere. Uh, in some, one uh, historian some years ago, Henrietta Mertz, suggested that the whole story of Jason and the Golden Fleece was a journey to Tiwanaku by, uh, the, by, by these Greek sailors and they crossed the Atlantic. Uh, actually went up the Rio La Plata, which is there near Buenos Aires, up through Paraguay and uh, into Bolivia, and then ultimately to Lake Titicaca and to Tiwanaku, which would have been a city of gold, where, where the buildings were wallpapered with sheets of gold. This is also a Pumo Punku. This is typical uh, trenching by archaeology. You, you, you take a site and you trench it, see what's there. Pumo Punku was hit by some giant tidal wave and just covered with mud and muck. And then here again are, are the keystone cuts. This is what you see. And now uh, giant blocks uh, are sitting there on pillars of mud at, at Puma Punku. Today, uh, like this area, you can't go into this area. Um, the Bolivian archaeologists have recently, and it, it may be from the Ancient Aliens program, they've decided, like, hey, we need to start excavating this place. So they've now roped off most of the place, and they have guards there to watch everyone. So you wouldn't be able, you have to go on the other far side of Puma Punku to see this. But yeah, I mean, this is evidence that, that Tiwanaku and Puma Punku were hit by some massive tidal wave and mud and muck that destroyed the buildings and, and then just, and, and buried the city in, in this mud. Early uh, excavations in the 1930s uh, by uh, a guy named P Arthur Poznanski. He, he was a Polish archeologist, Polish German. Huge, huge, giant statues like this that are there. As you, this is now in an area of uh, a part of Tiwanaku, actually, which is in Puma Punku and Tiwanaku are, are just uh, like a kilometer or so apart. And I thought this was very strange. There's parts of it here where it looks like this block has some kind of super cement was put in to um, to, to fill it in. And it, it's things like this that Chris Dunn pointed out to me, where you have these. Uh, s curved blocks like this, and it's these inside corners like this where, where the curved section of the block and the straight sections of the block come together. Now, and this is what requires lathes and power tools to do this. And what's interesting here, is, and as Chris would point out to me, the monuments in Egypt and the things at, at Tiwanaku, what mainstream archaeologists are saying is that the builders are, are bashing this out with a stone hammer in their hand. And you, can't, you cannot do something like this with a stone hammer in your hand. You, you need, at the very least, uh, very sharp chisels and, and, and ultimately, really, power tools, diamond saws, grinders, and things like that. 
This is one of the megalithic doors there, uh, and, and they're monolithic doors in the sense that they're actual doorways cut out of a single piece of granite. It's lying on its, on its side. This is kind of what the Gate of the Sun is. You can see these holes at the bottom. They have to do with, uh, again, like um, uh, men metal or stone plugs uh, little uh, that would like help hold it up that would be on the floor to be in there as they put it up, that it would sit on these little stone pins and things like that. You also find these monolithic doors in Persepolis in, in Iran today. And, and Persepolis is pretty interesting. And we, it's the, the building style and, and again, just cutting a doorway out of one solid piece of granite, that's what you see there. This is what uh, one of these monolithic doors would, would look like. And again, so you're, just the articulation, uh, I mean, not only that they're quite heavy, but just to, to articulate, to cut, and to make these things, again, this requires uh, really precision type instruments. This is in the museum at Tiwanaku, and here's one of the metal clamps poured into the keystone cuts. All right, well, let's now just go briefly to Egypt. And this is Luxor Temple in, in uh, southern Egypt. And there's keystone cuts there, too. And these hourglass ones, and, and one looks like an axe head, these are keystone cuts. And they're this, the same as the ones that are at Tiwanaku. This is the Temple of Edfu. And it has blocks of stone also with keystone cuts on it. But this is an example of uh, a wall, a structure in Egypt, that's being built out of older blocks. They're recycling blocks that were, none of these blocks or keystone cuts here, uh, and you know, some are just by themselves, they, they even match some up. But yeah, this, this wall has nothing to do with the original builders or where these keystone cuts would be. They just, they would not be on a wall like this. They can't be on a vertical wall. So this is Egyptians reusing older blocks to build this wall, ones that have keystone cuts in them. All right, now we're gonna go to Vietnam, to central Vietnam, uh, right near Da Nang. This is an ancient city, a megalithic city called Mi Son, or My Son. It also has keystone cuts too, exactly like the ones that are at Ollantaytambo and at, at Tiwanaku and, and Puma Punku. Exact same kind of T shaped, and also the hourglass uh, keystone cuts, like you see in Egypt. And the people who built this were called the Cam people. They were the Cam, they're uh, megalith builders. And in fact, ancient Egypt was called Camet, or Camet. So in theory, where, wherever you hear the word Cam or Cam, you're, that's, that's the word for ancient Egypt. But this is in Vietnam. More of the keystone cuts. These, this is basalt, very hard stone. These people too, whoever's building this, they're using the same technique and power tools to build this. This is what Mison looks like. And the, the capital of the Cam, and, and by the way, Cambodia is, is, is named after these people too, the, the Cam. Um, this, is, this is what Mison looks like. And their capital, the Cam people's capital was right off the coast and it was this island called Kulao Cam. And so these people, they were uh, megalithic uh, builders. Uh, their, their main capital was actually an island off the coast of Vietnam. And it would appear that they were crossing the Pacific Ocean and they were somehow involved in probably the building at, at Tiwanaku and, and in, also in Peru and Sacsayhuaman. The Cam also have a lot of similarities with the Olmecs. We'll see that in, in a minute. These are some Cam statues. Um, the Cam also, a lot of the Cam people looked uh, very African. Um, they were uh, supposedly Hindu and, and Buddhist. Here's another Cam statue. He also, he's got, he looks very African. He's got also the, the, the tight hair. He's got a white nose. Uh, this is a Cam statue there. He, this is supposedly Shiva with third eye and the forehead. This is a statue from, from Misan. This is also a statue from the Cam from in Misan. And this looks very Mayan. I mean, and if you, or, or Olmec. And if you were to take this and show it to somebody in, in Mexico, they would probably say, oh yeah, that's a Mayan statue. That's some. Um. Uh, Graham also showed that photo of uh, the pyramid in Indonesia. 
uh, which also looks like a Mayan pyramid. All right, this guy too, he's a cam guy, and he's got the beard and the mustache, also the long earlobes. And that's a big thing with um, uh, Buddha and, and Buddhists. Uh, Buddha is always uh, depicted as having very, very long ears and, and earlobes. Uh, here's a female cam statue. Uh, has a lot, uh, it's a lot of similarities with, with statues in India and, and other statues in Southeast Asia, but also statues that are uh, in Mexico and, and Central America. This is at Angkor Wat in Cambodia, and the same keystone cuts and clamps are there too. And in fact, when I was at Mison in Vietnam, and I showed them to our guide, the keystone cuts, and he, he had never seen them before. He had no idea what they were. I had to explain them to, to Mike, I had to explain them to the guide what it was all about. So these were Japanese excavations at Angkor Wat, and here's, this is one of the clamps, just like the ones at Tiwanaku and Puma Punku. Um, they also, at uh, Angkor Wat and, and other areas around there, also these, uh, what are, seem to be these monolithic doors. All right, also in Indonesia, as Graham pointed out, uh, megalith building does still continue. These are some guys on the island of Nias, which is off of Sumatra. And this is a photo taken by some Dutch guy about 1908 or something of them moving this, this big megalithic block, which may have already been, you know, somewhere else, and they're just removing it that we don't know. This is at Bada Valley in Sulawesi. Uh, Graham also went there with Santa, and, uh, and uh, Jennifer and I went there some years ago. This is a very strange place. So it's in, it's in Bada Valley. It's in central uh, Sulawesi. Very difficult to get here. It's a high... Uh, mountain, uh, valley, it's, they claim there that this is where rice began. And the, the, most, um, the old, most oldest primitive versions of, of rice. This is what Bada Valley looks like when you can get up there. They only, it was only 10 years ago that they built a road to go into this, area, into this place. Uh, it also seems to be a gold mining area. Whoops. So you have these unusual statues, very kind of sort of tiki type statues. We'll just look at a couple of them. Here's the really big one. And what's interesting to look at this guy with the nose is, is the eyes. This also very well made. Um, they don't know who made them. They, they think that they're at least 6,000 years old. But uh, as you look around the eyes and the nose and these eyebrows, it appears that, again, power tools are being used. I mean, it's very, very perfect, precise of um, uh, just cutting of the stone. And it, it, in my, you cannot do this, really, it, as far as I'm concerned, without power tools. What you also have in Bada Valley are these granite stone jars. And these are also very difficult to make. I mean, it, somebody, again, apparently power tools, I mean, they just took a granite boulder, turned it into a big jar, and then hollowed it out. And we don't know what for. No one knows why they would do this. Um, they're just lying around, either broken or, um, uh, or just in somebody's farmer's field. They don't do anything with them. They don't, they don't know what to do with them. So why they would be here, you can see uh, a broken piece. And yeah, so somebody it's with, with power tools is just doing this. And, and they had some purpose. I mean, we don't know what. But again, it would, if you, archaeologists would think, wow, this would have taken you know, a long time to bash this out and create this, but with power tools, it would be done quite um, quickly. Th there's a similar place in Laos called the Plain of Jars, and it also has all of these stone jars, they call them. And they, again, they don't know what they're for. They have no idea. They don't know who made them. They don't know how old they are. They're just they're utterly um, you know, baffled by it. This is another place in uh, also in northern Cambodia called Priya Vihar, and it's a lot like Machu Picchu. It's a megalithic building, and it also has the keystone cuts there too. So the idea that people separately around the world are going to invent by themselves this unusual way of fastening megalithic blocks independently is impossible. I mean. Basically, the same builders uh, with their power tools and things, they're making all of these buildings all over the world. Let's go back to Peru and Bolivia. This is what, this is what architects conceive Puma Punku to, to be like. So this is maybe what that building looked like originally. Here's the H blocks again. 
being fitted. Uh, that, you know, they, they're trying to figure out, you know, what this building even looked like. And it's pretty futuristic kind of place. All destroyed now. I mean, just, just some tidal wave and earthquake just, just completely wiped it out. At the museum there, you know, this is, this is what had to happen. But, you know, so here you have, you know, th these natives in their, you know, simple cotton tunics. They've got their little campfire here. They're, they're melting metals, and then they're pouring them into the clamps. You know, and it, so it's this oddball mix of very primitive with what is so incredibly sophisticated. But uh, the mainstream archaeology, you know, they, they can't, they don't get it. They just, they, this is, this is what one of these H blocks would look like. I mean, the articulation and the, just the creation of all that. Now, this is a, actually a pyramid that, that archaeologists have not acknowledged yet. It's near to Tiwanaku, and you can see it from Tiwanaku, but there's a village there. And basically, the villagers are looting this pyramid. And we tried to go there one day and drive with our minibus, and we went partly down there, down to the village. But our guide told us, he said, no, uh, we, we shouldn't go into the village because the villagers won't like this. You know, we're, because they're, well, they're looting this, this pyramid. What came out of uh, that pyramid and around it there's a couple of unusual objects. One is the, the Potiki monolith. It's a granite monolith. And it's, it's today in the, um, the Gold Museum in La Paz, but you can't see it. Although, when we went, it is on ancient aliens, and ancient aliens paid to have them bring this out of the vault. It has Sumerian writing on it. OK, uh, two types. Now, Sumerians also, they wrote in a, a hieroglyphic writing, and they also wrote in um, in a, in, a, in a cuneiform. So there's, there's along the thigh of the, the monolith is, is Sumerian writing. And what was also found in this area is this thing. This is called the Fuente Magna Bowl. And the Fuente Magna Bowl also has Sumerian writing on it, but both types. It has Sumerian hieroglyphic writing on it and Sumerian cuneiform. And, it, it, and it's decoded. I, I talk about this in my book on ancient technology in Peru and Bolivia. This is the guy. It came from his house, Maximiliano. And he used it for a while. He, had, um, his, uh, his, he, he fed his pigs through this bowl. <laughs> and finally, around 1960, in fact, and then archaeologists somehow kind of saw this, and they were like, hey, you know, maybe this is some ancient artifact. But it should be in a museum or something. And they traded him a house for it. Yeah, and they said, well, you know, give us this bowl and we'll, we'll give you a new, you know, house to live in. And, you know, houses there aren't, aren't like nice houses in Colorado or anything. But So anyway, so the Fuente Magna Bowl is, is, a, is a time bomb for mainstream archaeologists. It can't be there. But it's in a museum now in, in La Paz. And it's on display. Bolivian archaeologists, you know, I, I say, yeah, this is real. I, I firmly believe that if this bowl had been found in Peru, it would be uh, suppressed by archaeologists. I mean, uh, mainstream archaeologists in Peru, uh, under pressure from uh, American and other archaeologists, they, they, they would not put it in any museum. But Bolivia is kind of a renegade country. And they don't want to be told what to do. They, they, and they don't want Americans to tell them you know, how to run their country or anything like that. So they, they put it in the, in the thing. I'll just run back to it. So this is it. I mean, this, this cannot be there. I mean, it's a Sumerian artifact in, in Bolivia, and it's thousands of years old. So I mean, there's, and there's even more to it than that. I mean, and here's the thing with this. Mainstream archaeologists, all they can do is just not talk about it. I mean, they, they, can't, they, they can never say anything about it. And, they, and so they won't. Uh, you'll see it on Ancient Aliens. It's, uh, it's in an episode. Go back and watch that one. It's a good one. But it's, you know, this is not going to be in a National Geographic special. I, I don't think. Although, I mean, yeah, maybe they will do that. Uh, I mean, they should because it's, I mean, this is, this is earth shattering. This changes the history of South America to completely. So anyway, uh, we're still back to, uh, this is the museum in Tiwanaku. This is what uh, some of the guys look like, some pottery. Uh, this guy looks very much like an Amara Indian, who the people who live around 
uh, Lake Titicaca and stuff today. But here's this guy. Now, uh, these guys are from Tiwanaku, too. The, the guy at the bottom looks very much like a Chinese guy. The guy at the top has the thick mustache and beard and stuff like that. He looks like some Mediterranean uh, Phoenician guy or something like that. He's from Tiwanaku as well. So you have, you know, you've got, you've got Europeans, you've got Orientals, and then you've got Native Americans. And now, also at Tiwanaku, you have these, these cranial deformation. The lycocephalus, as they call it, cone heads. Th by the way, this display has been removed from the museum now. You cannot see it. It's, it's all blanked out with, with uh, brown paper. So some of these are, you know, they're, they have the extended craniums. And uh, you weren't supposed to take any pictures there, but, you know, I'm, rules are meant to be broken, right? So, <laughs> all right, now let's go to the, let's go to the coast in Peru. We'll, we'll go uh, to Ica and to Paracas, and um, we'll look at stuff there. This is really, because it's so dry, this is a very good area to look at the unusual skulls and craniums. Uh, tons and tons of, of uh, literally hundreds of these unusual elongated skulls, and they're a lot. Um, it's, these are, they're in many of the museums in Peru. The, the area there is so dry that uh, skeletal material and craniums and things like that are, are well preserved. I mean, these craniums really are unusual, and, and they are in, in many cases double or triple the size of, of a normal human's cranium. Now, and so, you know, we, the idea that some of these guys are somehow extraterrestrials, the Anunnaki, there is a, a way to, to manipulate uh, the craniums of, of infants, and, and we know that, they, that people did this. And, and the whole idea, I mean, it's baffling, again, to, to uh, archaeologists. And now, this is the Chongos Pyramid near Paracas, Many of the, uh, these unusual craniums and things like that have been found here. I mean, some of these guys, I mean, they are some weird looking dudes. And not the kind of guy you want to, you know, meet in a dark alley or something, you know. Now, this is a very unusual one. This is also from Paracas. Now, before, you know, when you're still an infant, you're the, you know, the plates in your head are going to fuse and, and things like that, and they ultimately fuse. But this is a very unusual cranium, and it's, not, it's fused in a different way than a, a human's cranium would be. And of all of the elongated skulls that are there in Peru, I'll, I'll go back to this again, this one is the most unusual. And people who would say that, yeah, these guys are not really human beings, as, as we are, there's something different. And, and that's part of the idea that you would actually have uh, people who are born, rather than it being a cranial deformation, uh, manipulating the cranium, but I mean, they, you know, they naturally have these elongated heads. And, and this guy, in theory, would be one. They've had some infants and, and supposedly fetuses, too, that have them. Uh, this guy, uh, tree panning, is something also that went on in Peru and, and all over the world. And that is cutting a, a big hole in the head for various reasons. We don't know exactly why people were tree panned. Uh, this guy had a gold plate put in his head, and, and it healed later, and it, his skull grew over the gold plate. Uh, a lot of the mummies and stuff there in Peru have red hair. Uh, in the same area is what's called the candlestick of the Andes. And, uh, and in fact, uh, in my mind, this is a, it's a scene really from the ocean. This was perhaps, it would seem like some signal to seafarers, also even people in airships possibly. Uh, one idea too that this is, um, is San Pedro cactus, which is a hallucinogenic cactus in, in Peru. It's only just south of there that is the Nazca Plain with all the strange lines and, and figures and things like that. Uh, archaeologists don't have a good explanation for it either. They're not. Uh, Maria Reiki uh, studied the lines for f 40 or 50 years, and I mean, she could never really figure out what they, you know, what was going on. She didn't think that they were air strips for, you know, aliens to land on or anything like that, but, but still, she couldn't really explain it. And there's, there's lines, there's geo. Geo, geometric figures and other other figures 
etched into the, the plane. And that's no big deal. I mean, they just by digging a little bit into the plane, you can expose it. But again, it, it's it, one thing almost everyone admits is that it's like there's be to be seen from the air. And there's not much point in really, you know, having doing all this uh, without seeing them from the air. And, and uh, one explanation, too, was given was also uh, hallucinogenic drugs and that sh shamans would take hallucinogens and then project themselves astrally over the Nazca plane. And this gave them something to look at, you know, as they were <laughs> flying around. Okay, so, yeah, the whole thing of this cranial deformation, the Olmecs did it, too. And th this is another thing, too, with the mainstream is that this cranial deformation is something that goes on all over the world, not just in Peru. And it's the Olmecs have it too. Uh, these are some Olmec statues uh, from Comacalco, which is an Olmec Mayan city uh, along the Gulf Coast uh, near to Villa Hermosa. This is what these guys look like, uh, it, with the, the cone heads and the, the coffee bean eyes and stuff like that. I mean, they were some, some weird-looking dudes. This is a, a pumpkin-headed guy from, from uh, the Yucatan. So this is actually in the museum in Merida in, in Yucatan. I don't know if it's still there. but So this guy, had his, his face was, was squashed in rather than uh, elongated. So here's one of the ways that you would do this to a child. And, and we know that this did go on. Uh, there's, there's no question about that that the children had these, these pressure put on their, their, their cranium because when you're still a, uh, a baby, really, the plates in your head haven't fused. And so you, like the Chinese foot binding or something like that, you can, you can manipulate the, the, these heads and things like that. And, and, it, and it's possible to create these cone heads too, apparently. Uh, the Olmecs themselves were completely unknown until around 1940. And in 1940, the Mexican government brought archaeologists from all over the world to a big conference, and there they laid out the Olmecs. And they said, we've discovered another uh, civilization, a culture that's pre-Mayan. And, and they had no name for it. They called them the Olmecs. And it all started with digging up these giant basalt heads in, uh, the, along the coast of around Veracruz and stuff like that. They were mainly buried. Uh, they, are, they weigh about 20 tons. They look, most Olmec, uh, at least the colossal heads, they look very African. And again, now, and, and most people when they look at them, uh, these are now, Ol these are Olmec guys too, giant boulders. Uh, these are in Guatemala. Th that's one of the things that they've, that they're just discovering, and, and I talk about in my book, how the, the Olmecs were on both the Pacific coast and the Atlantic coast. And in fact, they stretched from all over Mexico and deep down into Central America to Panama and, and uh, even to Colombia and stuff like that. Tomorrow we'll show some things. Uh, very well made, finely carved heads, um, uh, again, buried and things like that. This guy and it looks very much like a cam. He looks in some ways sort of oriental, also um, uh, kind of African. Today, many of these uh, colossal heads are at a, a really good museum in, in Jalapa, Mexico, which is near Veracruz. But this is what they found them in these jungle areas. And this is, the, um, this is what they, like La Venta, they, as they excavated it, it, it had really well, uh, good drainage and, in a sense, plumbing. So the whole Olmec area, see, that's what they call the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. And it's the narrowest part of Mexico. And so it's, it's also the narrowest part between the Pacific and the Atlantic. And the Olmecs really, their, their heartland and, and many Comacalco and Levanta are, are near the Atlantic. But a lot of Olmec stuff is here in the Pacific and particularly in Guatemala and stuff like that. And actually cities like Monte Alban, which is in that area too, uh, there is, would be an Olmec city too in, in my mind. Uh, mainstream archaeologists say that the, the Zapotecs actually built Monte Alban. But anyway, okay, this is also a, a Olmec statue, which is at the Jalapa Museum, and it looks very Egyptian. And he's wearing a, like a false beard, as the Egyptians wore this, this beard. This is an Olmec guy, too, and he's holding a rubber ball. The, the rubber ball, the, the, the game 
the rubber ball game, the ball court game, was, was played all through Central America and as far north as Utah. And if you go to uh, Hovenweep uh, or to uh, Wupatki near the Grand Canyon in Arizona, you're going to see ball courts. And, th and the rubber ball, they would have to use those rubber balls also coming from Central America and, and really the jungle heartland of, of Chiapas and areas like that. Now, this is also an unusual uh, one of the colossal heads of the Olmecs. And what's strange about this, and mainstream archaeologists have noticed this too, and they don't have an explanation for it, it's how somebody was defacing this with these little dish marks on, on the, the helmet. What's going on here, really, it seems, is that somebody with a power tool, like some kind of grinder or something, was just purposely defacing this and making these little scoop marks with his power grinder. Um, Something like that. At, also at the old Mac Park, these also small dish marks and drill marks. It's like somebody again with a power tool was just you know making this, uh, just like playing with his power tool. Ultimately, this is also at Comacalco, uh, which we saw on the map, and it just shows you some of the pottery and statues that were found at Comacalco, and they are bizarre. And now, get this. You know, if you look at some of these guys, I mean, some of them look like spacemen, uh, others uh, like Africans, Orientals, all kinds of weird guys, uh, some very, very Chinese. The Mexican government and that museum, they have removed this display. I was there about two years ago, and they, they took it off display. Uh, again, perhaps because of the Ancient Aliens show, because, you know, th this is the kind of thing on Ancient Aliens, you'd go like, whoa, who are these guys? And mainstream archaeologists realized, you know, these guys are really just too weird, and let's, let's get them off display. How about that? At La Venta, they also found uh, what are called, the, this, this was called a votive offering. It's, it's out of jade. There's these little uh, tall things in the back. They're called jade Celts. They're a kind of a ads, um, a tool that would be like, a, just, uh, like an ads type tool. But what it also had on it was Olmec writing, and an expert came. This was only, and it, this was in, in 1999, and it, would, and it only appeared in U.S. News and World Report. But this guy was, he came from Beijing, and he was the Chinese expert on Shang Dynasty early Chinese writing. And then he said that, yeah, the writing that's on these jade Celts is Shang Chinese writing. Uh, this is this is in my book on the the Olmecs that's over there. Okay, um, the 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 Egyptians also did this cranial deformation. This is Meritaten, uh, who was the, the daughter, one of the daughters of Akhenaten and Nefertiti, uh, sister of Tutankhamun. So she too has this elongated, unusual head. Tutankhamun is a cone head too, uh, and his, although you, they never talk about it in. Um, uh, you know, when you talk about Tutankhamun, this is a statue from, and another statue from his tomb. This is, this is, a, this is Tutankhamun's own statue of himself. So he also has this elongated head going back and a, a, basically a cranium about twice the size of us. These are the Ubaid figures from Samaria. They're from about 4,000 BC, so they're like 6,000 years old. They're real. They, they are these so-called Nephilim figures. They have also these elongated craniums. They have what's called coffee bean eyes, which is kind of an unusual you know, depiction of the eyes. And then they have, the again, the elongated craniums. So these are, in a sense, these Anunnaki figures. And, and they're real. Uh, again, whether, whether they're just humans with these weird elongated heads uh, or there's some kind of extraterrestrials or extraterrestrial hybrids, you know, we, we don't really know. Um, but the Sumerians, is that we were looking at the Fuente Magna Bowl at Tiwanaku, and yeah, I mean, that's, that's from these guys. Okay, are the Chinese. This is this supposedly these Taoist immortals and stuff in China. I mean, this guy's this guy's an extreme cone head, to say the least. Uh, so yeah, I mean, these guys were doing this in China. Uh, these are some other Chinese guys. They have what are called the the pumpkin head or jaguar head. I mean, it's you know why they were they're doing this. Uh, whether people would naturally look like this is bizarre. 
they were doing this in the Pacific Northwest too. And this is a Chinook Indian from uh, the Seattle area. And they had also these elongated skulls. I went to high school in, in Missoula, Montana, and, and to the University of Montana, and the largest freshwater lake west of the Mississippi is a lake just north of Missoula called Flathead Lake. Well, it was, it's named Flathead Lake because the Flathead Indians lived there, and they were called the Flathead Indians because they were coneheads and had these, these the, the flat, elongated heads. So the idea, too, it's almost like with the people who are doing the cranial deformation, they all say, or it's part of their mythology, that they're doing it because the, the elite also had these cone heads. So at the very least, they're imitating this you know, royalty that are coming from Samaria or something like that. Now, this deformation, this is happening in Central Africa. This is uh, in an area of the Congo. This little kid, he's, he's having his head bound. He's, he's going to be a cone head. This is taken about 1920 by Dutch uh, anthropologists. So this is what his, his head would have looked like. In the island of Vanuatu, which was also which was hit by that typhoon only just some months ago, it was in the news. They also do that too, and also the Kurds. And right up until the 1960s, really, this was being still done in northern Iraq, and in and in Vanuatu. So I thought I would throw this in. Um, in 1934, in Wyoming, in the uh, San Pedro Mountains of Wyoming, some prospectors dynamited uh, a cliff face in the San Pedro Mountains. And what they found sitting there was this tiny miniature mummy sitting in a, like a meditation position. And he's known as the San Pedro mummy. Here's a uh, uh, x-ray of him. I mean, he was only about two feet tall, uh, seemed to be a fully developed uh, adult person, yet he was very small. He he disappeared. I'll go back. This is what he looked like. He was kept. In 1950, he was sold to, to somebody. And it was, you know, was privately held. And their photos. And at, at that point, he disappeared. And no one knows where it is. And that's why this guy's offering $10,000 for it. I mean, it, somebody has this thing somewhere. And he keeps it, you know. Again, it may be suppressed. Uh, this is not the kind of thing that the mainstream archaeologists, they just don't like stuff like this. They don't like skeletons of giants who are 8, 9, 10 feet tall. They don't like skeletons of little people, too, who are only 2 feet tall. An interesting thing, too, he's in a special meditation posture, supposedly, I'm told. Another Colorado thing. This is called the Granby Idol. It was found in, near Granby, Illinois, which is uh, kind of north-central Colorado near the Wyoming border, I, I haven't been to Granby. But this was found there, and it also, it's carved out of basalt. He's kind of doing a thumbs up kind of thing. Uh, he's supposed to be some kind of Olmec thing. There's strange writing on his stomach. Uh, we don't, you know, we just, we, and he's kind of disappeared too. There's photographs of it, we don't know where he is. But yeah, just exactly who he was and, 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 and what the writing is there that maybe kind of Sumerian. Now the Salmon Ruins in New Mexico, which is right near Aztec, New Mexico, they also found an unusual slab there in the 1930s, and it had elephants carved on it. So, you know, you have to wonder what elephants were doing in, in New Mexico. And if they're like, well, were they either mastodons or perhaps they were elephants brought out from, from Southeast Asia. How am I doing here? Uh, okay, I can go a few more minutes. So, uh, all right, now we were talking about the Olmecs and everything. Let's go to, um, let's go right now briefly to Colombia. I was just there briefly, uh, or a few months ago. And at San Augustine, and starting in the 1930s, and a lot of the excavations went right up uh, until the 1970s, they also started uncovering all these giant statues. And this is an area kind of near the, getting near to Ecuador. Weird. Weird, weird statues, also with big noses, uh, very Egyptian kind of look to them. Uh, in my mind, kind of this is a Olmec thing, or, or similar to Olmecs. Uh, this guy too, like with a false beard and, and, and stuff like that. Some of these guys are like uh, gorgons with big uh, 
teeth, uh, some kind of a monster. Uh, other guys are wearing a special kind of Egyptian-like um, breastplates and, and turbans and things like that again. Uh, there's other statues there of uh, birds and things like that. They're, they're all megalithic, uh, largely buried. Uh, strange uh, granite tomb buildings, also very finely cut. And it was also megalithic uh, that sort of tomb, sarcophagi kind of stuff. Um, this is what it looks like around San Augustine. It's high up in the mountains. It's an oddball spot. And apparently also what was going on here is, is gold mining. It was a gold mining place. It looks like they had uh, power tools to do some of it. This is what it looks like today. Look at this statue here. I mean, this is, again, like that statue I was showing you at, at Bada Valley. This w appears to be made with very you know, precision power tools. If you look around his eyes and, and, and nose and, the, and his cheeks and stuff like that, yeah, these are very, uh, very sharp, sweeping uh, lines on this face. I mean, it's not something you can do with a rock hammer in your hand. Uh, you have the, the, you have also dolmens and things like that. A lot of the sites were, were buried. There's another site also nearby called Tierra Dentro. It also has a bunch of statues and underground uh, tombs and things like that. Weird statues, very similar to San Augustine. It, it really would be, the, I think, the same people doing it. It's also a gold mining area, high up in the mountains in, in a volcano. This guy was wearing some kind of oddball backpack, almost looks like some uh, jet pack or something like that. Um, this is another statue also from Tierra Dentro. Uh, some woman, she's wearing a very elaborate kind of hat and stuff like that. And again, you have to wonder, this was a pottery that was found there. I mean, he looks like some cool space guy. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you, I mean, this is what they look like. Uh, this, the people at San Augustine, they, they must have looked like him and dressed like him. Now, the gold, as all this gold was taken out of San Augustine and Tierra Dentro, and it's now in the gold museum in, in Bogota. And so here's some of the guys there. I mean, here's one of the gold figures. I mean, this is an ancient thing coming out of, of Bogota. And uh, yeah, he's, I mean, he's some kind of weird looking guy. He's looking like some spaceman or something like that. This is also in the gold museum. These are all pretty small gold pieces. I call him the, the fireman. Uh, and uh, it looks like he has either a big mustache or a big gold plate in his nose. There at the gold museum there too are, are like gold sun discs and things like that that would have, and that's what was at the, the Cori Concha, the, the sun temple in, in Cusco was a big gold disc like this. And even what looked like, again, like power tool pieces or something, rotary things. And in fact, they call this uh, a rotary disc, like it's some uh, bronze and gold uh, saw, you know, blade or something like that. Um, this is also on display there. These are uh, crystals and, and pieces of amber, and they're drilled through. So, uh, and this is on display there. They're, they're using what would have to be precision power drills to drill into these pieces. This is also the museum there. They were, a lot of these guys were also coneheads there. So I'm kind of winding it up here. There's a piece of pottery. This is what one of the guys looked like. Let's go back to him real quick. Looks kind of oriental. He's a cool guy. I mean, pretty interesting art. And so many of the people look, they look either like monsters, they look oriental, they look African, many look uh, Mediterranean. And it is at the Gold Museum that has the famous gold airplanes. So you have the gold airplanes, and in fact, uh, Giorgio of Ancient Aliens, it's if you join his little club, you get a, one of these gold airplane pins that he gives you. They're cool. <laughs> and he's a great guy, too, uh, an old friend of mine. So yeah, so these are what the gold airplanes look like. They're small. Uh, mainstream archaeologists, of course, I mean, they can't be gold airplanes. They must be something else. So uh, you know, they're saying, well, they're like flying fishes or something like that. But flying fish. Birds and, or, and flying fishes do not have tails like this and, and other things. They're uh, 
they seem to be, you know, basically kind of an airplane model. Gold, and, and even, they do have gold flying fish there. Here's one, you know. So, yeah, they're making gold flying fishes, but, but it would seem that these other things are somehow kind of airplanes. Gold is indestructible, by the way. All gold in the, of ancient times still exists today. Uh, you, you cannot destroy gold. Um, it's, it's, it's indestructible. So, I mean, that's, that's and, but you can't really date a gold piece either, but you can take it in situ. So the whole idea of ancient flight and uh, the manas, the, the Ramayana, and, uh, which is part of the Mahabharata and so many of the ancient Indian texts, I mean, they talk about Vimanas flying machines, and they're very specific that they, they are flying vehicles. Uh, Eric's Chariots of the Gods. This is Rama in his flying chariot. This is in the Bangkok airport uh, and in Thailand, which is really a Buddhist country. But every Buddhist, I mean, there are millions and millions of, of Hindus and Buddhists all know the story, and they all know about Vimanas and the flying machines of ancient, of ancient India, in a sense. To have uh, flying machines really like today and, and power tools, you need electricity. And actually, and we know they had electricity in ancient times. You need machines, you need cog wheels. We have like the Antikythera device that was uh, found in um, off, uh, the, the Antikythera island uh, 1900 in, in the Aegean. Once it was studied in the 1950s, I mean, they Archaeologists and, and it, it was American ar archaeologists too that studied it. They were amazed. They just never imagined that in the ancient world there was anything like this: cog machines and wheels. Uh, what would be like a computer? They think the Antikythera device was actually a, a, a computer that was like an astrolabe, and, and would, you could dial up um, constellations and, and perhaps use it for navigation and, and things like that. And it has a date on it too. It was built in the island of Rhodes. At the Temple of Dendera, there's uh, a number of uh, reliefs like this. Uh, they appear also to show electricity in ancient Egypt. You see here uh, uh, the, the jed pillars uh, on the bottom and, and cables are, are coming out the, the back. It appears to be uh, uh, some kind of a, probably like a big lamp or something. The, the filament is uh, the, the snake in the middle. It's absolutely real, and there's a number of these at Dendera. Mainstream archaeologists have to explain this too, and, but it can't be elect some electrical device. So their explanation is that uh, this is a lotus flower, and this is the aroma of the lotus flower. Um, that, that's their explanation. Um, I, you know, I, I'll, I think it's an electrical device. So yeah, that they had elect the idea that ancient Egyptian temples were, were lit even by electrical lights. And in my book, Technology of the Gods, we get into that. Many ancient temples supposedly had light, lights that never went out inside them and stuff like that. And it's, it's probably that you know, your average person in their little hut probably maybe didn't have electric lights. But in the temples, they did. And that, that was almost part of the religion and stuff. At Abydos is this famous lintel. It's high up on the... Uh, Let's go back to it real quick. And uh, this kind of famous, this thing that looks, supposedly looks like a helicopter, this thing down here, like a, also like a plane. And then there's this plane right here, also looks like kind of a jet or something like that. Um, main, this is real. Mainstream archaeologists have to explain this too. And their explanation really is that, and, and it, it does work for some of them, that it's, it's two hieroglyphs superimposed on each other, and so then it suddenly looks like a helicopter or or a plane or something like that. But I've been told by archaeologists that this one right here in the middle, this jet plane one, that they, they can't figure that one out. And it's that, that, that the explanation that it's two known hieroglyphs put together it doesn't, doesn't work for that. The idea, too, that in ancient times they had heavy machinery like backhoes and bulldozers and graders and stuff like that is interesting. And we have this thing, this gold pendant from, from Panama. And this is also real. It's, it's in a, the museum in, in Panama City. It's made of gold. Uh, the stone is inset uh, in, on the top of it. They're not exactly sure what kind of stone it is. Um, but what it seems to uh, depict is a, a, a backhoe, some kind of heavy machinery. It's called, it's, it's called a zoomorphic pendant. It's about uh, six inches long. This is the top again. 
This is the front. He's got even a little breast plate and stuff like that. Uh, this is again what it looks like. It looks like it has a digging uh, backhoe kind of thing on it at the very back. And this is what it would kind of look like as, as heavy sort of machinery. So in a sense, the idea here is that, yeah, there was somebody was using you know, heavy machinery, heavy grader or something like that. People witnessed it. And it's like a monster to them. And so they create you know, this what's called a zoomorphic pendant out of it. And actually, you know, if you're coming from, you know, coming from Illinois, where Caterpillar and John Deere are, I mean, heavy machinery, graders, backhoes, uh, bulldozers, and all that stuff are so important to our civilization today, just uh, you know, working with the terrain and moving earth and stuff around. And it appears in ancient times they did that too. Uh, they found a, what appears to be a model of a glider in a tomb in Saqqara, and this is well known. The whole idea of, of the manas, people having these, these airships that are flying from one place to another. Uh, the ancient Chinese have stories like that. So the, the idea of ancient people having flight and flying places is, is a well known. The Kebra Nagast, uh, which is the sacred book of Ethiopia, also talks about King Solomon and his, his son, Menelik, and uh, they, this queen of Sheba, and She's got her radio over here too, you know. Just. So, Lis listening to Art Bell at uh, Coast to Coast. <laughs> and again, like Assyrian uh, things, you know. Here, here you got the the wing disc. It's the flying disc, and there's you got three guys up there. They're. We'll, we'll see you later. We're we're taking off. When you read the the. Ramayana, Mahabharata, they talk about these horrific wars. They have airships, they have these Vamanas, they have all these incredible weapons. It, it's, it reads like Flash Gordon or Buck Rogers, and, and they're blasting each other and destroying whole cities. I mean, it's, it's, it's this devastating wars and things like that. And so, uh, you know, archaeologists is, you know, figured, you know, it's all just, you know, wild science fiction from ancient Indians and stuff like that. But when British and Indian archaeologists started excavating at, at Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa in Pakistan, and these are, this is uh, one of the seals. This is some kind of extinct Brahma bull that uh, no longer exists today, a proto uh, cattle of uh, India and stuff like that. But when archaeologists got to the street level at Mohenjo-Daro, what they found was people lying dead in the streets. Some doom had taken over this whole city, and everyone was just killed. And then the desert came in, and, and, and nobody buried the dead or anything like that. The desert came in and just buried these cities in dust and stuff like that uh, for thousands of years. And then it wasn't really until the, the late 1940s that archaeologists uncovered this. In many cases, they're holding hands and stuff like that. It's like some atomic war just wiped these people out. So here's uh, Vishnu flying around on Garuda. I mean, the, throughout India and, and all through Southeast Asia and stuff like that, the, the idea that they're, they're flying around, they have these flying vehicles. Except, you know, so they, but uh, they, the idea they don't really have knowledge of airplanes and stuff like that, so it's got to be these chariots being drawn by, by eagles or swans or something like that. In the Ramayana is a story of uh, Rama and Ayodhya. He supposedly lives in this forest over here. Uh, his wife is kidnapped by this other guy, or, or, or maybe she runs away with him. Uh, in the story, she's kidnapped. And then supposedly he takes her to a place called Lanka. Some people think it is Sri Lanka. Uh, this would be, you know, Rama's chariot. They, they all have these vamanas that they're flying around in in the, in the movie, or in the book, I mean. And these are these satellite photos from southern India going in. And this is what they call Rama's Bridge. And apparently, like at Key West, going out along the Florida Keys, there was like this ancient causeway and road that really went from southern India and, and Tamil Nadu area to the northern part of Sri Lanka. And most of it is underwater right now, but, it, but not much underwater. It's in maybe 30, 40 feet of water. Uh, ships move through this area. They have to be careful not to get grounded and stuff like that. And that is also, this whole thing of Rama's Bridge is, is the story also in the Ramayana. There was a book uh, that was supposedly found in the Royal Baroda Library uh, called the Vimanika Shastra. 
in the 1920s, and it was a book all about vimanas, how they were made, the power system and stuff like that. Uh, talked about the Rukma Vimana. It was apparently like a flying saucer kind of craft. Uh, these drawings were done in the 1920s by Sanskrit scholars who were like going through it. Uh, there, there's no uh, illustrations of the book or anything. The Tripura Vimana was a kind of a, a cigar-shaped, elongated craft. The Shikuna Vimana was a, a, like a winged type craft. And then other texts, uh, and I talk about them in my book on, on Vimanas, often they talk about Mercury. Mercury is as part of the power system of the Vimanas. And Mercury is uh, Mercury's an element, it's a metal, it's a liquid. Uh, it's a conductor. Uh, you can, you can, Mercury in Western tradition was the, the messenger god. He flew through the air. Um, the, the, the symbol of Mercury is the caduceus, which is also the medical symbol, and it's kind of a vortex type thing. The whole idea here, too, is that there's a kind of a Mercury engine, a, a gyro. Mercury, because it's a liquid and, and a, a metal and a conductor, it, you, can, you can put electricity in it. So, uh, yeah. And you know, I realize I'm out of time now. And that was the interesting thing here. There's one last little thing. If you go to Area 51 in Nevada, where supposedly they're you know, retro-engineering alien craft or just making their own flying sauce or whatever, there is a town there. And that town is called Mercury. And you, you can't go there because it's there's a highway sign for it. it says you know Mercury over here and you can see it but you would need a security pass to to go into that city but so yeah the the town for the scientists in in area 51 is basically called Mercury Mercury Nevada so that is my presentation for uh, tonight and tomorrow we would get into more of this and also Tesla and obelisks and then we will go to the moon and Mars so thanks very much thanks well we'll see you all tomorrow I hope. David Hatcher Childress, the voice of ancient aliens, one of the most prolific researchers, David Hatcher Childress. Stop. Stop.